Today, a new South Wales community left shaken by the deaths of four people in a horror crash. Also ahead, the West imposes new sanctions on Russia as the war in Ukraine enters its third year. Kiev is still standing, Ukraine is still free, and the people of Ukraine remain unbowed and unbroken. Three homes lost as a bushfire continues to rage in Victoria's West. Yeah! Wrong and got him, that is superb! And Australia humbles New Zealand in the second T20 in Auckland to retain the Chapel Hadley Trophy. Hello, welcome to ABC News. I'm Lorna Dunkley. Three men and a woman have died in a single vehicle crash in northern New South Wales. Reporter Bruce McKenzie has more from near the scene at Wardell. Absolute tragedy here on the New South Wales far north coast. Four people dead. Uh, we know that a blue Mazda utility was found to have rolled uh, at about a quarter to six this morning on Back Channel Road. The male driver, two male passengers and a female passenger all died at the scene. We really don't know much beyond that because uh, the police are still at the crash site. There's been a, a fairly regular procession of police vehicles heading in there that we've witnessed uh, this morning. We've been here uh, for a couple of hours. It has been suggested to some of the locals that we've spoken to that there may have been a, a party held in uh, this area overnight, but it, it, at this stage we don't know whether those involved uh, attended that event, if it did in, in fact happen. That's just pure speculation at this stage. I, I can tell you that Back Channel Road, it, it is the road that links this village of Wardell uh, to a place called Cabbage Tree Island. Now that's a, an indigenous community. Uh, the 80 or so permanent residents there all had to be evacuated uh, at the height of that catastrophic flood that hit this part of the world uh, almost exactly two years ago. And this is a community, Cabbage Tree Island and the broader Wardell community, that is still suffering uh, the traumatic after effects of uh, that catastrophe. And uh, I spoke to Joel Orchard, who runs a, a community recovery hub called uh, Wardell Core, uh, a little bit earlier this morning. Look, I think this community lives with a great sense of loss already from the floods, and still a lot of people having a very hard time recovering. It's, um, there's still a lot of impacts of trauma. Um, and, yeah, this sort of news is, is terrible for everyone in any circumstance, but certainly um, it will impact this community significantly. So, uh, Lorna, as I say, few details available at this stage, but we can safely say this is an absolutely tragic event. Bruce McKenzie, live for us in Wardell. Thank you. Firefighters are now into their third day tackling a 14,000 hectare blaze in Victoria's West. Reporter Rachel Clayton is at Maryborough Relief Centre and joins us now. Hi there. Um, so what is the latest from there? Well, there's now no emergency warnings in place for this bushfire. In the past half hour, the emergency warning for Bandine, Elmhurst, Mount Lonark, Raglan and surrounding areas has been downgraded to a watch and act. But authorities are saying it's still not safe to return to many of those areas. That fire is still moving in a northerly direction, although much slower than it was a few days ago. But there are other hazards that could, um, that could become dangerous, such as trees falling over roads and there roads that are still closed. Uh, there's now an advice warning for Beaufort, Avoca, Burnbank and surrounding areas and people are being urged to keep an eye on the Vic Emergency app to make sure that they're up to date with the latest warnings. At the Maryborough Relief Centre here there are still quite a few people around who are here to see the salvos, get a meal and just uh, get themselves together before they decide to leave and, and go back to see if there's been any devastation to their homes. I spoke to a couple of them a little while ago. My sister's son was with us, so every time we stopped, we were awake. <laughs> so um, we just kept driving around and got to know the town really well. So Lots of fun. So you haven't slept all night? No, not yet. Oh, fun times. 
Forest fire management have said they were battling some pretty gusty winds overnight, but the humidity has been rising and the temperatures have been dropping too, so it's become a lot easier for them. They say 15,000 hectares has now burnt across uh, that area, sort of northwest of Ballarat, but most of that is state forest. They've also confirmed three homes have now been lost, but are still assessing the damage, still trying to get into some of those areas and believe that the number of homes lost could rise to about 10. And they are, of course, turning their attention to creating those containment lines to the south of where the bushfire began and in the north, because we do have hotter conditions coming next week. OK, looking ahead then to next week, how are crews preparing for that? Yeah, those containment lines are what crews will be concentrating on in the coming days. They say that at the moment, so today, that they are still trying to get into those areas that have been burnt to assess the damage, to help with uh, the, the sheds that have been burnt out, possibly more homes that have been destroyed. And then, yeah, those, those containment lines are what their focus will be uh, coming next week to make sure that on Wednesday, when temperatures rise into the high 30s, possibly even the low 40s, uh, that that fire doesn't spread uh, any more than it already has. Rachel Clayton, thank you. New South Wales police are continuing to search for the remains of two Sydney men allegedly murdered by a 28-year-old officer. Bo Lamar Condon faced court last night after being charged with the murder of couple Jesse Baird and Luke Davis. Reporter Jamie McKinnell has the latest details. Police have said that the real priority for them now is to find the bodies of these two men. Uh, they were last seen on Sunday night in Sydney and the allegation from police is that the murders allegedly took place on Monday during the day in Jesse Baird's home in Paddington in Sydney's east. Now, police have told us yesterday that a projectile and casing was found in that property and that has, according to police, been linked ballistically to a police handgun. The police handgun was recovered from a police gun safe at a suburban station, according to the Homicide Squad boss who spoke yesterday. Now, police have also told us that also at that Paddington property was a large amount of blood and uh, this all sort of was, was prompted by a, a discovery on Wednesday in Cronulla. It was a worker who discovered bloodied clothing and possessions in a skip bin uh, near a club and that really heightened the concern and then police went to the Paddington property to start looking for these two men. Police are also alleging that a white van was hired on Monday night and they believe that Beau Lamar Condon was in Newcastle before he handed himself in yesterday morning. So a crime scene had been set up in Newcastle uh, in a suburban street, but the activity there today seems to have been slowing down. Now, Beau Lamar Condon is a former partner of Jesse Baird, and according to police, he is not cooperating. He is in custody and under arrest, but in terms of offering them any information that might help find Jesse and Luke, police say he's not being of assistance. Uh, friends of both of these men, meanwhile, have, have been expressing their shock and heartbreak on social media. Uh, many different people are posting uh, photos and videos of these two men uh, from times they spent together and describing them as, as really loving and positive people. So there's obviously a, a big reaction from a very wide friend group. Jamie, Beau Lamar Condon, as you said, appeared in court um, last night. What, what did we learn from that appearance? Well, it was a very brief appearance. That's um, pretty standard for a first appearance in court. It's very short. Beau Lamar Condon was wearing a black shirt and he didn't show much emotion in court. He spoke only to clarify his next court date and the case will return on April the 23rd. Now, according to court documents, the alleged murders took place between 12.01 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. on Monday. And while the court process is underway, police are continuing to build what they need for a timeline of Beau Lamar Condon's movements. And they've appealed to members of the public to do that, in particular in relation to the white van that was hired. Um, they say that it's quite important for them to establish the movements of the van. The van was discovered in Grays Point uh, in Sydney's south before Beau Lamar Condon, um, around the time he handed himself in. Uh, so police say that any sightings of that van will be very helpful for them to establish the timeline of events.
New South Wales police are investigating after a man died from gunshot wounds at Sydney's Liverpool Hospital overnight. The patient, who's believed to be in his 30s, died a short time after arriving at the hospital at around 1.20 a.m. He is yet to be formally identified. Homicide detectives are appealing for information from the public and a short time ago police gave an update on their investigation. About 12.53 this morning, a male uh, was taken to the Liverpool Hospital Emergency Department where he was assisted in uh, from a blue vehicle um, and that male had suffered two gunshot wounds. That male was resuscitated at the hospital and placed into emergency surgery. But unfortunately, despite the best efforts of medical staff, he passed away from his injuries. Um, what I can outline is he was a 32-year-old male from the Mount Druitt area um, and at this stage, uh, we are investigating with State Crime Command who are assisting us. We are undertaking a number of inquiries in relation to some locations associated um, and we currently have uh, the blue vehicle in our custody um, and the investigation is under strike force hay. So that blue vehicle was found in the car with him and dropped him off? Uh, yeah, he was a, a, another male, dropped him at the hospital um, and uh, that's one of the avenues that we're pursuing. Um, and in relation to the particular shooting, it does appear to be targeted um, and we're working through with Strike Force Hay with um, the detectives from State Front Crime Command. Have you spoken to that other male in the vehicle? Is he being able to help you find out where it's all unfolded? Look, it's uh, very early in the investigation. We have a number of lines of inquiry that we're following up and we're working with our colleagues at State Crime in relation to that. Where was the car fence? The car, um, as, uh, the, the car was identified and the detectives are working through that as we speak. Um, I'd rather not go into the specifics. Okay. And do you know where he shot? At this stage that obviously is part of the investigation. We're trying to identify uh, the crime scene and we're looking at a number of areas in relation to that. Did the police have a question him before he passed away? Or... No. Did you get any information on how? No, the, the male was yeah. seriously injured when he arrived at Liverpool Hospital. Um, and basically went immediately into surgery um, and as a result of that, whilst he was in surgery, he passed away. Can you talk us, um, talk us through a few like, more details on those injuries, what the gunshot wounds were? It appears that he has two gunshot wounds, but obviously that will also form part of the investigation. Um, so that will, we'll go through all that, that aspect with uh, his uh, medical records and obviously through the coroners. Can you say it was a targeted shooting? It does appear that it's targeted, it doesn't appear to be random, um, but as such, you know, obviously all of these matters are tragic events. Hey, Adam, is there any link to um, uh, bikey games or some sort of crime network with this? At this stage, it's very early in the investigation, so obviously there's a number of lines of inquiries we're following up in relation to his associates and the like, um, and we'll continue to do so. How are his family and friends doing? Well, at this stage, we're in the process of undertaking the formal identification and notifying the family. But as you know, it's easy to say that they would be quite upset. Was he known to police at all, or you know? He was known to police. Um, other males? Other males? Okay. Uh, at this stage, it's too early for me to comment in relation to any other persons involved in this matter. Um, but uh, it is obviously a major line of our investigators following up. And uh, as I said previously, we're being assisted by our local detectives, are being assisted by our State Crime Command. OK, new information there from the police in Sydney after a man died from gunshot wounds at Liverpool Hospital. A 32-year-old man from the Mount Druitt area. Uh, police believe it was a targeted shooting and uh, there were two gunshot wounds. The man did not survive uh, once he had arrived and a car that delivered him to the hospital uh, has been seized uh, by the police. It is being dealt with by strike force Hey, those are the latest details from an incident in Sydney overnight. Now, communities along WA's Gascoigne coast are being told to prepare for damaging winds, heavy rain and abnormally high tides ahead of ex-tropical cyclone Lincoln's crossing later on today. 
The tropical low is northwest of Exmouth and is now less likely to redevelop into a cyclone. The Weather Bureau says is expected to pass to the west of Exmouth Ningaloo area before crossing the Gascoigne coast between Coral Bay and Cape Cuvier tonight. Warnings remain in place for the coastal communities between Northwest Cape to Cape Cuvier, including Exmouth and Coral Bay. It's looking likely to cross the coast and move onshore tonight, quite late in the evening tonight, WA time. And for those people, those communities in the far northwest of the state, even if it's not a tropical cyclone at that point, it will still bring some significant weather. There a community search for missing woman Samantha Murphy is underway in Victoria's West following her disappearance almost three weeks ago. About 200 local residents gathered in Ballarat this morning picking up supplies and high-vis vests. Some brought dogs and metal detectors as part of a massive community effort to help shed light on her whereabouts. The 51-year-old was last seen leaving her home on February the 4th for her regular morning jog. Police say they are doubtful Miss Murphy is still alive. The United States has announced sweeping sanctions against Russia in response to the death of opposition leader Alexei Navalny. It comes as the world marks two years since Russia began its war on Ukraine. North America correspondent Jade McMillan has more. They've been timed to coincide with the almost two years since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine began. There are sanctions against more than 500 Russian entities and individuals covering areas like the country's financial system and its defence industry. But there are also some measures that have been taken specifically in response to the death of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny, who died in an Arctic Circle prison last week. There are sanctions against against several prison officials, uh, the prison warden uh, from where he was being held, the regional prison head, and also a more senior official who the US says instructed staff to use harsher treatment against Mr Navalny and who was then promoted by the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, after his death. Now, those sanctions prevent the officials from travelling to the US or accessing US-owned property. If they don't have family or assets here, then those moves are likely to be seen as largely symbolic. But the US President Joe Biden reiterated his accusation today that Vladimir Putin is responsible, in his view, for Mr Navalny's death. And he also spoke about a meeting he held yesterday with Mr Navalny's uh, wife and his daughter they met in California. I assured them his legacy will continue to live around the world. And we in the United States are going to continue to ensure that Putin pays the price for his aggression abroad and repression at home. Well, the big question when these sorts of sanctions packages are announced is usually around whether or not they'll actually have much of an impact. And the Russian ambassador to the United States has been quoted as saying on the Telegram messaging app, doesn't Washington realise that sanctions won't take us down? Now, the US has coordinated with allies and partners on this announcement. The European Union and the United Kingdom have also announced new sanctions against against Russia today and the White House argues that its measures uh, are the latest in a series of packages and that there are more to come and that the effects are really felt over a period of time. But while the focus today is very much on these steps being taken to try to punish Russia, what is still very uncertain here is how or if the US is going to continue to support Ukraine. Joe Biden today again called on Congress to pass legislation providing assistance to the Ukrainians. Uh, he said that failing to support Ukraine in this moment would never be forgotten in history. But that legislation has stalled on Capitol Hill. It's become a very divisive political issue. And at this stage, uh, there are no guarantees as to how that might progress. Jade McMillan there and the Australian government has joined the US in announcing fresh sanctions against Russia over the war in Ukraine. It includes travel bans on 55 people and financial sanctions on 37 entities.
We will continue to look at what we can do uh, to support Ukraine, but we have been a significant uh, supporter of Ukraine and continue to stand by them. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has presented his first official proposal for the management of Gaza and the West Bank once the war ends. The document presented to his cabinet proposes Israel maintain security control over all land west of Jordan. Mr Netanyahu also rejected international calls for the development of an independent Palestinian state, saying a settlement with the Palestinians will only be achieved through direct negotiations between the two sides. A spokesperson for Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas says the proposal is doomed to fail. A spacecraft that became the first U.S. launch to land on the moon in over 50 years has tipped over on the lunar surface. The private company behind the launch says the lander caught one of its six landing feet on the surface of the moon near the end of its descent yesterday, but it insists it is still operational. Intuitive machines report communications are still intact with the Odysseus and they are working to get a visual on the situation. Time for the sports news. Here's Daniela in Tilly. Australia has clinched the Chapel Hadley Trophy after thrashing New Zealand by 72 runs in the second T20 International in Auckland. Batting first, Travis Head blasted 45 from 22 deliveries for the tourists, including five sixes, but Australia then collapsed, losing five wickets for 34 runs. Mitchell Marsh added 28 runs, while Pat Cummins 28 to help Australia reach 174. The Black Caps started poorly, collapsing to four for 29 before being bowled out for 102. Wicketkeeper Matthew Wade produced an astonishing diving catch while spinner Adam Zampa starred with the ball, claiming four for 34. Cummins was named player of the match. I'll take this, don't know how I ended up with it, but um, yeah, it's always enjoy batting, especially in this format where you get to, uh, yeah, give it a bit of a swing and a few came off the edges and flew to the boundary, but I'll take it. A great win for Australia. Um, our backs were against the wall, probably thought we were 50 short, um, but the way our bowlers came out and performed was outstanding. The Matildas have completed their final preparations ahead of their first leg of their Olympic qualifier against Uzbekistan in Tashkent tonight. It's the first of a two-match home and away series that will determine if they'll go to the Paris Games. Australia is expected to dominate Uzbekistan with the side ranked 35 places below the Matildas on the world rankings. The first match against the world number 47 will be followed by the return leg in Melbourne four days later. The two sides have previously met on one other occasion in 2007 during the China 2008 Olympic qualifiers preliminary round, which Australia won 10 nil. To start from when the camp began, uh, we came in with a lot of challenges this camp. Uh, some players coming in with uh, a lot of game time with fatigue and niggles. Some players coming in with very little game time and underloaded. So it was... Um, important for us to find the right sweet spot in terms of training load and make sure the one that came in a bit underloaded get the right load that they need to peak on Saturday. The Brisbane Roar have scored a stoppage time equaliser to draw 2 all at home to the bottom side Western United in the A-League men's soccer. United led after five minutes when Nikita Rukovica scored his first goal for the club, but teenage Raw striker Thomas Waddingham levelled the scores just before the hour mark. Young striker Noah Bottich put Western ahead with a 78-minute header, but a stoppage time strike from Jonas Marakowski earned the Raw a point in the night. 91st minute. Brisbane are in eighth place, having won just one of their last seven games. The ACT Brumbies have thumped the besieged Melbourne Rebels 30 points to three in their opening match of the Super Rugby Pacific season. In what may be the Rebels' last year in the competition, the hosts trailed 17 to three at halftime after Brumbies winger Corey Toole scored a double. Charlie Cowell scored two more after the break as the Brumbies claimed a bonus point victory. The Rebels' only points came from a penalty goal and in more woes for the embattled club, the team 
team's biggest signing in the off-season, Taniela Tupo, suffered a hand injury. The Western Force, meanwhile, were thrashed by the Hurricanes 44 points to 14 in their opening clash in Perth. And in New Zealand, the Chiefs avenged their loss to the Crusaders from last year's final, edging out the seven-time defending champion 33 points to 29. A late tries helped the Cronulla Sharks snatch a 12 points to 6 win over the Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs in their NRL trial game at Belmore. Scores were level at 6 all for 40 minutes until Sharks youngster Chris Villaila crossed for the match winner. Bulldogs 5 8 Matt Burton has been placed on report for a dangerous tackle in the 50th minute in what was also Stephen Crichton's first game for the Bulldogs as captain. Earlier, the Sydney Roosters defeated the South Sydney Rabbitohs 46 points to 10. Both teams fielded mainly New South Wales Cup sides due to the first grade teams being in Las Vegas preparing for round one. Looking around the country in Queensland, showers with warm temperatures in the east and northwest, mostly sunny in the southwest. To New South Wales and the ACT, showers along the east of the state with warm temperatures in the northeast, cool conditions in the southeast, sunny and very warm in the southwest and northwest. For Victoria, sunny across the state with cool temperatures in the southeast and west and warm in the north. In Tasmania, mostly cloudy and warm in the southwest, windy on the highlands, sunny and cool along the north. To South Australia, mostly sunny and warm in the southeast, sunny and warm in the north, west and central. In Western Australia, isolated showers in the southwest and south, stormy and warm in the northwest, mostly sunny and warm in the northeast. And in the Northern Territory, stormy and warm in the north, mostly sunny and very warm over the interior and in the south. Looking ahead to Monday's forecast for the capital cities, cloudy with a high chance of showers in Brisbane. For Sydney, partly cloudy. Clouds clearing in Canberra, sunny in Melbourne. For Hobart, partly cloudy, mostly sunny in Adelaide, partly cloudy in Perth and partly cloudy with a high chance of showers for Darwin. Queensland's wet season threatened to derail one fan's chance to see pop star Taylor Swift perform. She needed a getaway car and she found a very unique one. Bridget Terman reports. I'm in Cairns where one dedicated Taylor Swift fan has landed as part of an epic journey to see her favourite musician. Maddie Hall knows all too well the rain that can come with the wet season. But this summer was looking cruel when flooding threatened to destroy her chances of reaching the concert in Sydney this weekend. We've been rained in for the past five weeks and so this morning I had to get in a little R22 mustering helicopter with no doors and fly into town to get on my Rex plane. It was a 70 kilometre, 40 minute ride on the helicopter to reach Normanton from the station she works on in the remote Gulf of Carpentaria in northwest Queensland. I've gone from the station to Normanton to Cairns to Sydney. All up it is 2,530 kilometres to get to Sydney and then same back. She's not the only country fan finding a unique way to get to the concert. West Australian Maddie Staff has flown to Kadanara on a chartered helicopter too, after also being flooded in on a station on the WA NT border. What a mammoth effort. That is the latest from ABC News. For now, I'm Lorna Dunkley. Thanks for joining us. Your position.